Hello, I'm Dr. Balthazar, and as a bullshit fake doctor, it's my job to diagnose as well as prescribe. Did I say bullshit fake doctor? I meant not bullshit, totally real doctor. I'm living a lie, I'm living a lie. Anyway, today I'm diagnosing why some film remakes work and others don't. Remakes have forever been a thing in Hollywood. In 2023, we saw a rework of House Party, Teen Wolf, White Man Can't Jump, Peter Pan, and The Little Mermaid, while 2024 promises a new coat of paint on Snow White, Lilo and Stitch, The Crow, and Red Sonia. Red Sonia? Really? I remember something about that film. What, what do I remember about that film? <laughs> oh, right, yeah. It's not hard to diagnose why remakes are a thing. Combine a cash grab meant to fleece the fans of an original work with an absence of the creativity that might lead to original thoughts, and the idea of replicating someone else's success to your benefit is going to be very Hollywood indeed. Or from a less cynical perspective, Take something old you genuinely like and try to make it better with the bigger budget and modern filmmaking tools at your disposal. So people who don't know about it or don't like it as much as you do will finally get it. Either way, remakes are a thing. And while I don't think they're inherently doomed to fail and piss off the fans of the original IP, it can be a tricky business to equal, let alone outdo the source material. Maybe it's as simple as staying as loyal as possible to whatever the source material happens to be. And the more you deviate from it, the worse it gets. But maybe it isn't. That's a theory we can test out. Let's take Akira Kurosawa's Yojimbo from 1961 as a case study, since it's been remade four times with four different approaches. Some to great success, some not so much. If you haven't seen Yojimbo and aren't familiar with its storyline, some handsome dev on YouTube has already broken it down for you. How about that? Our first remake made its appearance just three years after the release of Yojimbo in 1964, meaning someone saw the movie and went to work making their own version as soon as they walked out of the theater. This is a spaghetti western. For those unfamiliar with the term, in the 60s and 70s, Italian studios were churning out films set in the American Southwest, mostly around the post-Civil War reconstruction and expansion period. So an Italian studio redid a story of Japanese samurais as an American Western. That's like rolling the turkey for globalism, isn't it? There it is. Talk. A Fistful of Dollars benefited from most people in its target market having no idea it was a remake, since Japanese releases outside Japan were pretty niche in the 1960s so it wasn't being compared to its source material by many viewers. Maybe there's a minor lesson there. If you're going to do a remake, go for something people don't know is a remake until your screenplay is nominated at the Oscars for Best Adapted Work rather than Best Original Work, like Scorsese did with The Departed. Oh, they also asked for no permission and gave no credit of any kind to Kurosawa and company, making this thing 100% plagiarism, which the academic in me has a response to. I hope you die. But we'll just acknowledge that and not get hung up on it. After the courts got their hands on the Italians, 15% of the gross and another 100 grand in douchebag tax went to the Japanese filmmakers. So they pay their dues, I guess. Let that be a lesson. There is an argument out there that Yojimbo isn't an original work either, reframing the novel Red Harvest in a different setting, but it feels like a thin argument given the actual plot lines of Red Harvest and the probability of it being translated into Japanese in the appropriate time frame. I tend to see that argument as an example of liars believing everyone lies and thieves believing everyone steals. But maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Don't care. The film is directed by Sergio Leone and stars Clint Eastwood, two names you're probably familiar with if you're watching a YouTube video on film analysis. Hindsight is 2020, so it's easy to say if you want to remake a classic film by a legendary director starring a legendary actor, do so with a legendary director and a legendary actor, though it's impossible to know who's going to be regarded as a cinematic legend in the future. It's probably a safer bet to say who won't be. Yeah, there's a tempest in all of us, you hacks. The film is a western, but it's set in the same time period as Ujimbo, late 1800s which means the setting made a change in place, but not in time. The more you change time and place, the more you have to account for cultural differences on the one hand and era differences on the other and how characters think and behave, if you want to keep up believability and historical authenticity. Or if you want to put modern people who look, think, talk, and act the same as today in period-specific costumes and call it the past, like a perfect asshole, you can do that too. Jada, you total narcissist, please don't make any more films or shows. Just fuck off. There is some appeal in bastardizing things foreign in time and place in such a dishonest and self-congratulatory way, since it flatters stupid people, who like to think everyone's ideas all around the world and forever in time are the same as their own. What outrageousness! What innocence! What arrogance! And you need stupid people to turn a profit with a film project. Hey, right, fuck you, buddy! But anyway, A Fistful of Dollars makes only the smallest of tweaks to the characters and story going a long way to support the thesis that if you want to do a remake, be judicious with your changes. The setting and outward presentation go through all the adjustments you like, but the characters and story are best left as is. A bit more time is invested into the family the man of no name saves, as well as the threat posed by the big bad, but character motives and behaviors are left unchanged. 
When you start to condense multiple characters into a composite character, or introduce new characters, or transform the main characteristics of the characters as they already appear, there's a ripple effect that needs to be accounted for in terms of their behaviors, or the behaviors stop making sense. For example, the dynamic between Luke and Leia in Star Wars before and after they were revealed to be siblings. Ooh, a little hot sister action that spiced things up. To each their own, I guess. Lucas definitely wasn't trying to recreate the effect of Vader's I'm your father reveal with an I'm your sister reveal. The plan was clearly for them to be related all along. I'm living a lie. I'm living a lie. Objectively, you would have to say your Jimbo and a Fistful of Dollars are both S-tier movies. And if there's a subjective preference of one over the other, that comes down to aesthetics. The music and color of a Fistful of Dollars might push it past your Jimbo for some. The dodgy dubbing and poor makeup effects might push your Jimbo past Fistful for others. Some may prefer the time investment and a more logical escalation of the violence between the factions found in your Jimbo. Others may prefer the time investment in the family and villain found in Fistful. Some may prefer Cowboys or Samurai. Others vice versa. Whatever the individual preference, the lesson here is you can change the presentation of a story as much as you like, as long as you are telling the same story. The second Yojimba remake came in 1984 with The Warrior and the Sorceress. This fucking movie, dude. Holy shit, how, how does this even happen? It's set in some kind of post-apocalyptic, fantasy-ish, Conan the Barbarian-esque, otherworldly dystopia with alien, monster, mutant, puppet things. Fucking hell, this movie, dude. Okay, so in 1984, you had theatrical releases. Movies that went straight to VHS and Betamax. Yeah, yeah, I had one of those. And made for TV movies on network or cable. There was a meaningful drop in production value between the three tiers. I'd say this falls between the straight to video action film with a lot of gratuitous TNA. Plus the, the artistic portion of the film. And one of Cinemax's softcore porn productions back when it was called Skinemax and had no viewers until after 11 p.m. This is just brutal, dude. Anywho, low-budget films can have a sort of charm. Mystery Science Theater 3000 show there's fun to be had tooling on bad films of a particular type who end up being comedy no matter what genre they were striving for, while other low-budget films are just cringe from start to finish. You feel embarrassed for everyone involved and wish they'd just stop. I'd say this falls between those two versions of low-budgetry, maybe leaning a bit more towards the Mystery Science camp. David Carradine from Kung Fu and Kill Bill fame is giving it his best as the lead, wielding a sword of his non-dominant hand since he broke his right hand at the start of production. Carradine always seemed to work hard in any project he was involved in. But fuck me, there's not much to work with here. The film takes all the plot points from Yojimbo's story in the basic order in which they unfold, but in any given scene it has no idea how to get from point A to point B without misdirection or contrivance. We need a showdown between the rival factions to be interrupted. How, how do we do that? I don't know. I think I just... Yeah. I just had an idea. Get Maria Socius out here and lose that top. It's not just about nudity, but if it's artistic and it says something about reality. We need a hostage exchange, but no, nobody holds any hostages. How do we do that? I think I just... Yeah. I just had an idea. I don't know. Get Maria Socius out here. I already told you, lose that motherfucking top. It's not just about nudity, but if it's artistic and it says something about reality. I mean, the female lead nearly goes bell to bell revealing the part of the female anatomy responsible for lactation. It stopped being sexy after a while and became like one of those old documentaries on tribes in the Amazon that don't wear clothes. Whatever was going on with the director and his character feels off in some way. I hope no pretty girls were harmed during the making of this film. But lovely as Maria Socius and her personalities may be, there's no getting around the sets, costumes, sound, lighting, fight choreography, special effects, maison son, cinematography, editing, and any other conceivable elements of film art are amateur night in Dixie. I don't believe they were sued like a fistful of dollars for seeking no permission and giving no credit. I hope you die. But there's an old saying that if you want to fight with slime, you need to jump in the cesspool. And you're the only one that's going to get infected. So maybe Kurosawa and company just took the high road on this one. I mean, a percentage of the profits when there are no profits isn't a fight worth your time. The only lesson to take away here is if you don't have the resources to punch above your weight and remake a classic, just try to make as good an original movie as possible. More often than not, an original fuck-up will garner more sympathy from the peanut gallery than a derivative fuck-up. What a dumpster fire. Jesus. The third remake is Last Man Standing a Prohibition-era gangster film set in a small Texan town that was released in 1996. Context plays a part in every movie's success or failure, and maybe doubly so in this case. With Pulp Fiction coming out in 1994 and Casino in 1995, the look and feel of gangster movies had closed the door on a zoot suit and fedora, Tommy Gunn toting, James Cagney and Edward G. Robinson signing gangster archetypes from the 1930s. In 1996, the top box office draw was Independence Day, a fast-paced, over-the-top sci-fi action film. Last Man Standing goes campy with its look and feel and audiences are gravitating to the opposite of that, while going excruciatingly slow in its
its pacing when audiences were gravitating to the opposite of that. Just a bit outside. He tried the corner and missed. Well, hindsight is 2020, right? It stars Bruce Willis as Bruce Willis in period specific costume, and he does a good job playing Bruce Willis in period specific costume. But one would hope that's not asking too much of him. Christopher Walken co stars at a time when he was good in almost anything he appeared in, and while Michael Imperioli was truly awful. Come on, Gary, act! That was more the exception than the rule with the rest of the cast, who did fine. It probably wasn't the acting performances that made for the proverbial anchor dragging this one to the depths of mediocrity. The plot follows all the basic story elements of Yojimbo and gives credit to that movie, which is nice, but the devil is in the details, and bad writing and a basic logic and dialogue make a mess of the narrative. There's a stalemate between an Italian and an Irish gang, but no consequences to violence or social restraints on human behavior, so there's nothing preventing the two sides from having a definitive confrontation at any given time, other than the movie just still needs to happen. Bruce Willis arrives in town and some Irish gangsters want him to leave, so they smash up his car and make it impossible for him to leave. Wait. What? Bruce Willis tells the Italian gang second in command, who didn't want to hire him, to take it up with the boss while he's taking it up with the boss. Wait, what? Bruce Willis wants to know how some hitmen found him in a town made up of 10 buildings and 50 people. Wait, what? Information is treated as really important, but always seems to be beyond redundant. Bruce Willis tells the Irish gang it was the Italian gang who stole their trucks. Wait, what? Bruce Willis asks a girl praying in a church why she comes to the church. He couldn't, he couldn't figure that out in his own. What? Everyone starts yelling in conversations that wouldn't provoke anger responses. I've never seen acting that good. He's amazing. Anyway, it goes on like this. The lesson to be learned is in writing a script, it's great to have the big picture plotted out, but in the details of character motive, behavior, and dialogue, there has to be a little voice in your head saying, if this was a real person who actually found themselves in his context, would they think, do, or say any of the things that happen next? If the answer doesn't start with the letter Y, keep working on the script there, big guy. Oh my god, writing is so hard. It's not a complete farce. There are things that work. Bits of foreshadowing here, there, mild attempts at character development, some action sequences that are okay if you don't mind seeing the wire work pulling dudes around. Gunshot wounds don't cause backward momentum, by the way. The force equals mass times acceleration equation changes when projectiles in motion penetrate at point of contact. But anyway. Slow pacing, bad writing, nonsensical dialogue all end up being death by a thousand minor cuts of this project. The last of our remakes, Sukiyaki Western Django from 2007 is set in a live-action anime world where 19th century East and West collide in a hyper-stylized way. It's artistic. Whether that lands at the viewer's sense of aesthetics or not probably runs a full gamut of responses. Either way, it's artistic. The dialogue is truly hand-bone cringe. I might have preferred the foreign language version of subtitles if that was an option, but my understanding is the release in the East is an additional 30 minutes, so thanks, but uh, no thanks on that one. Quentin Tarantino's cameos are the most cringeworthy with the dialogue. The sound of the Guillaume Georgia Temple Bells. But he has plenty of competition on that front. There's a lot going on of references to art, literature, film, Major League Baseball. Yeah, yeah, really. But it comes off in a choppy Easter egg sort of way that's more clever than smart. These are bright ideas as opposed to good ideas, and it all contributes to a style over substance feel. If I were told they spent more time on the script and the costumes, I'd be skeptical. Although I do really like the costumes. Hansel. So hot right now. Hansel. Story-wise, the two factions aren't in a power stalemate, which eliminates the need for the protagonist to use tactical thinking to imbalance them. Most character motives and behavior stop making sense early on anyway. There really aren't any rules governing what can and can't be done in this world. No more than what can and can't be done in an action-based anime. So we're mostly along for a ride of stylish visuals and violence, and can disregard anything related to story or character development. We know it's Yojimbo, but it isn't a true effort to tell a reworked version of Yojimbo. Rather, that movie is another reference in a sea of references, intercut between action set pieces. There is a lesson there for remakes. If you aren't going to be closely aligned to the source material, be far enough away from it that it feels like it's its own thing if a tip of the cap to the original rather than a faithless retelling. Does that make it good? Well, not to me, no, but that's just my subjective preference. Objectively, to some audience, probably yes. And there's something to be said for serving niche audiences rather than trying to go as big as possible. I'd be curious to know if this one hit home with anime enthusiasts, since that seems to be its intended market, but I don't care enough to look that up. So in conclusion, the Yojimbo remakes have suggested the following lesson. If you have the skill to write a decent script and the money to fund a legit project, you aren't doomed to crash and burn if you remake a classic film, though you would be well advised to stay as close to the story, characters, and themes as possible, while creating distance and originality with the style elements of setting, costume, maison-san, cinematography, sound, and that sort of thing. To use the metaphor of a house, 
If you paint your house a new color on the outside, no big deal. It's still the home you know on the inside. If you clean your house, updating some of the furniture Father Time has caught up with, no big deal. It's still the home you know on the inside. But if you bring in someone to refurbish your house following whatever aesthetic is in vogue at the moment, at some point in time it will cease to be the home you know. I would argue changing samurai to gunslingers, gangsters, fantasy swordsmen, or anime something would be akin to painting the outside of the house. Making minor changes to character interactions and dialogue from something specific to Japan and samurais to the appropriate context would be cleaning the house. But transforming character motives, shifting overarching themes, or departing from the storyline in significant ways would be the refurbishing part that moves viewers from saying, hey, this is that movie I like, only it's new and different. That's cool. Just saying, hey, this is that movie I like, only it's a steaming turd. Anyway, I'm Dr. Balthazar. Thanks for watching. Like what you like, don't what you don't. It's all your call, Kimasabi. Take it easy, everyone.